We'll see. We'll see if that lasts. How about I just fold it? Today's story is, uh, by the way, I'm so appreciative of the storytellers. Uh, that was a big, big chunk of scripture to memorize in a week when you had a child in the hospital and Christmas uh, coming. So I don't know where Elizabeth is, but I'm very appreciative of that, of that work uh, being immersed in the word. The story that we hear today in Luke is not repeated in any of the other gospels, but it's a dramatic account nonetheless. And it yields for me one of my favorite characters in the Bible, Simeon. We don't know anything else about Simeon. He doesn't appear beyond this time on story. We don't know anything about his prehistory either, as we learn about Anna, the prophetess. But Simeon, I want to lift up to you today as someone who has a faith we might live and learn by. And I want to just pull out several characteristics about Simeon and his faith and ask if we could, as modern people, still have a faith uh, like Simeon's. Um, first of all, I want to point out how interesting it was when we hear the biblical stories and we, we go and we, to the Advent services, we hear the prophecies read from the scriptures and um, it seems like there's kind of a smooth and seamless story being told. But actually for the, the people of, of Jesus' time, before Jesus' time, there was a long kind of period when it seemed like God was being quiet. There were hundreds of years where it seemed like Israel was kind of stuck in promises made but unfulfilled. And, and so we can't appreciate quite the extent to which Simeon, when it says that Simeon is described as righteous, devout, and looking forward to, or awaiting the consolation of Israel, the extent to which it's significant that there were some people who remembered that God still had promises out there. And that God, though not seeming to act upon any right in front of their eyes, that God still would be faithful. So one of the things I want to lift up about Simeon first and foremost is that he lived trusting in God's promises even when he didn't see them unfolding. He lived with expectancy and trust in God as a basic characteristic of his life. He was looking for the consolation of Israel that was spoken of in the prophets when the penalty would be over, when comfort would come through the Holy Spirit, when healing would begin, when an age of new justice would start. He looked for that consolation, and though he didn't see the signs around him, the hope informed his very being. So he lived with expectation and trust in God. Second thing. You notice one of the, you know, we, again, we take this for, we have this biblical language. Well, Simeon is one day out there living and then the spirit tells him, you know, I've, I'm, I'm going to work now. I want you to go to the temple. The Holy Spirit was instructing him and guiding him. Any of you ever feel like God talks to you? And when God talks to you, do you kind of wonder if uh, now we have our psycho psychological analyses, if it's other voices in your head? Maybe it's the, your mother's voice coming back in a different form, or your father's voice, or we don't trust our instincts. We don't trust our listening. So it makes it sound very clear in the scriptures, the Holy Spirit guided him and Simeon just obeyed. The Holy Spirit had revealed to him a promise that he would not um, see death before he saw God's Messiah. 
before he saw the Lord's Messiah, the anointed one, the one who was the instrument of God's salvation. But then that spirit spoke to him and told him to go into the temple, and there he went. And I think it's easy to imagine that uh, it was just so perfectly clear to Simeon that exactly what he was supposed to do because uh, somehow the Holy Spirit spoke to him with incredible vividness where there was no ambiguity or no lack of clarity or no sense of risk or what am I thinking, but I think that that's rather putting more magical into the text than belongs there. I think that uh, Simeon had taken a risk to learn how to listen to God, and he was willing to listen and be obedient when he felt God giving him a leading. This uh, hymn that he breaks out into when he sees the baby, um, Master, now you've dismissed your servant in peace. Mine eyes have seen the salvation that you've prepared. Simeon, uh, oftentimes, like Anna, is seen as an old man. We actually don't know if he's an old man. The scripture tells us we, we know Anna must be very old. She's spent at least 60 years of her life praying and, and being engaged in intercessory prayer in the temple and fasting and seeking God's will. But uh, we only think of Simeon as an old man because, because of this this sense that he has of saying, okay, I'm ready to go now. Um, you've been at work. Your word's been fulfilled. I've gotten to see what you promised me that I would see, what I've lived to see, and now I'm, I'm content. And so we think of him as an old man because we think of his kind of life purpose being ready, he's near death. But I'm not sure that there's any necessary reason for thinking that. I think um, more I get the sense from Simeon that he, he was someone who clung to God's purpose more than he clung to life. That rather than clinging to life itself and trying to find in life its purpose, he found God's purpose as the source of life. And, and when that was being shown to him, when it felt like he had a sense of completeness about his part in it, he was happy to go on. His life, in a sense, was full enough. He was at peace and ready to let, let go. I don't know that it means that he uh, was near physical death. But he lived for a purpose. He clung to purpose and trusted God's purposes as the source of real life, more important than physical life only itself. And so, when he saw what had been promised to him, God at work again, he was accepting, peaceful, ready for whatever would come his way. Simeon, in his words of prophecy that he mutters with the baby in his arms as he looks down at that child, gives one of the most significant statements about the nature of God's salvation to this point. Now, there have been a lot of words in Luke's gospel so far about this baby and God's purpose for the baby. Um, Mary has had um, lengthy explanation given to her. Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist, was given some explanation about what his son was being prepared for, to prepare for. But to this point, all of the words explaining the purpose of this baby have been about the fulfillment of Israel's dreams, have been about God making Israel right again. And Simeon, has a sense that God's plan and purpose is not just about the people of his descent and lineage, the people of Israel, but in fact, his words are, 
Master, now you're dismissing your servant in peace according to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and glory for your people Israel. Simeon's words are the first words that indicate that what is good news for Israel must be good news for all people. Simeon gives us our first sense of a universal purpose for God who created all and desires to redeem all. Simeon had a generous spirit. Another thing about Simeon's work, mine eyes have seen your salvation. It's interesting. If you look back at the, the promises of scripture about a messianic king or a suffering servant, and you realize that Simeon was just looking at a baby. He was seeing just a little tiny snippet of God's plan being fulfilled. He was just being given a little piece of knowledge he didn't see the big picture. And yet he was content to allow God to fill in the blanks according to God's goodness. He was content with some mystery of knowing peace and part of God's plan and not of understanding everything. And finally, what I think is so significant about Simeon's faith is that he was full of wisdom. Although he was optimistic about God and God's good purposes and God's power to bring them about, he was realistic about human nature. In the second part of the, the prophecy that he gave specifically for Mary, he anticipated that this baby, this instrument of God's kingdom, that this baby would cause controversy would cause falling and rising of many, and that even Mary would experience some pain and suffering as a result of her love for him. Simeon knew that although he trusted fully in God's goodness and God's good purposes, Simeon was wise enough to know that the best things in life, including God's best things in life, don't always happen easily. <coughs> And the people of God will not always find life easy. I wonder if Simeon's a faith is a faith that we could embrace today, if it's really something that would be helpful and important to, to lift him up as a model. And I, I, I found myself just coming back to, to him each time in this scripture. And, and, and I, think, um, I think there's something about our age that that made me find him just so compelling and so um, engaging and admirable. Unlike Anna, who, wonderful woman that she was, almost it looks at the end of this story that she's been praying for 66 years or and well into advanced age, spending all her time in intercessory prayer, asking for God's will. It almost seems when the baby, she sees the baby and starts telling people about him, like she's brought that kingdom in herself by her prayers. But Anna was a church person. And one of the things I love about Simeon was he had to get pulled by the Spirit into that temple. He was a lay person. He was out in the world. He was a person of deep faith, living his life out in the world, not in the easy uh, circumstances of, well, People who are ministers sometimes think it's really hard being a faithful person in a church, but, <laughs> but people who live, uh, people who are in uh, the everyday work world, I know, look longingly at the work that people can do in churches that makes it so close to our faith. But Simeon was a lay person out in the world, still being faithful, studying God's word, holding fast to the promises. Simeon could be like all of us. I like the idea of Simeon's faithfulness and hope in God's promises that were long yet unfulfilled. When I think about our time today, um, in our day and age, 
how quickly it is to forget any promise that's made. In our overwhelming sense of pace and time and, and our quick need for gratification, even our inability to uh, hold on to the promises we make to ourselves at the beginning of the year every year. I think I saw 8% of um, New Year's resolutions are fulfilled, which is um, a little bit of an indication of what can happen in our forgetfulness or unwillingness to hold on to a promise we make to ourselves for even a year. It's hard for us to remember and trust and be patient with a timeline that's anything longer than a month. And yet God's big plan, and this scripture gives us a glimpse of a hinge point in God's big plan, goes on in a timeline and on a scale that we cannot fully see, we will never fully see, that we simply are asked to trust in. Even God's promises for our own lives sometimes take much longer to work out than we possibly imagine that they will. So Simeon calls us to live with expectation even when we are not seeing things move forward. Simeon calls us to today Learn how to listen to God's prompt. Listen again for the Holy Spirit. We might today need to be more conscious about embracing spiritual disciplines that help us listen in this loud and noisy world where there are voices all around. The people who benefited from the Rule of Benedict class and who will again, it's one method for trying to learn how to listen for God's voice so that we can recognize the Holy Spirit. The United Methodist Women are having a day for women, and I hope anybody in the church, uh, of prayer, of spiritual renewal at the end of January, a way for people to start to learn to listen for God's voice so that with our skeptical minds, We've all been raised with a spirit of skepticism about things spiritual, that we can learn to actually listen and recognize God's Holy Spirit prompting us so that we might be obedient. We can learn that from Simeon. We can also learn that life <coughs> is given to us. In the old words of a Westminster Confession, the purpose of life is to glorify God, to live and glorify God. We might learn with Simeon that life is best lived when it's lived for a higher purpose and not clung to for its own ends. We might live more joyfully and more freefully and more at peace with ourselves and with God if we lived our life focused on a higher purpose like Simeon. In this day and age in which we live in a world surrounded by people of many faiths and many different philosophical perspectives about faith. In our very multicultural, multi-religious world, we would do well to understand, like Simeon did, what it is to deeply grasp and honor one's own tradition, yet still be generous enough to understand that what is God's good news must surely be good news for all. We might, in the spirit of Simeon, become people who deeply appreciate and learn and root ourselves in our traditions, but learn how to listen, respect, and appreciate the wisdom that comes from others that's desperately needed in our world today. That generous spirit that sees God's purposes, a light of revelation for all Gentiles, and the religious people of God. We might also be people who are content to live with mystery. Um, you know, one of the things that we learn in seminary and as I was taking a lot of doctoral courses in theology, there are 
different theories and different ways to see and interpret every scripture and there are different flaws in every interpretation and there is no one nice, neat, whole picture that makes everything clean and resolves all the problems and to live as a person of faith is to live with a lot of knowns and unknowns. But to learn to be content with mystery and not decide that because we have part and we don't have scientific verification that we need to throw away or discard might be an important thing for us to live, especially as we are people who have understood that traditions of our faith can be turned against God's purposes. We are called upon to be people who are able to tolerate living with some uncertainty so that we can be open to God's new things. And finally, I think we are called to be full of a little bit more wisdom about life itself. God's good purposes in life are not always accomplished easily or smoothly or without human cost. And, and God's purposes, nevertheless, can be good and are good. And um, in the world in which we, we tend to measure things by how comfortable it makes us or how convenient it is, um, this word of Simeon's wisdom, I think, finds us, uh, calls us to a, a deeper trust. Simeon leaves us with a choice to make as we encounter God's new gift to the world in Christ, a choice to make of whether or not we will find ourselves in our lives in a position in which we can also be at peace because we have seen God's goodness and love revealed. Even more than Simeon, we know the rest of the story of Jesus, his suffering, his death, and his resurrection. Even more than Simeon, we have reason to know that God has a purpose for life that goes beyond our physical lives into a deeper spiritual reality. And so I pray that as we celebrate the remainder of our Christmas season, or maybe even try to detox from our Christmas season, that we would experience um, the peace that Simeon did of trusting that God is good all the time in God's big picture of which we can be part by faith.